Good morning, everyone. We appreciate your coming out uh, today. We're delighted today to have uh, Dr. George Ligler to present a special seminar for us. Uh, George is the proprietor of GTL Associates, which has provided consulting services to the aviation, computer, and telecommunication systems industries uh, to 48, 42 uh, clients on three continents. Uh, he holds uh, the master's and doctorate degrees uh, in computer science from Oxford, and he has had a long career uh, in uh, advising uh, government standards and, and, and activities related to, to um, aviation systems and other, and other uh, activities. Um, in addition, he has been a, um, a real friend to the university, uh, providing uh, pro bono uh, advice and consulting services to check transfer and intellectual property. Uh, in February of 2017, he was elected to the Special <clears throat> Fields and Interdisciplinary Engineering Section of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering for his leadership in engineering innovation in specifying and implementing complex computer-based <coughs> systems for aviation and the U.S. Census. So it's, um, I, I could uh, talk for quite some time on the recognitions and, and contributions that he's made, but uh, what I think I'd rather do is to turn it over to George for his presentation. So your question. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Well, good morning, all. Uh, we're going to talk today about one of those complex computer-based systems for aviation, but we're going to talk about it from the perspective of an, of an interdisciplinary computer system engineer. So, bridging at least, you know, if I look at the curricula of the departments in the College of Engineering, I resonate with five of the departments. Not all of them, but five of them. <laughs> and, uh, and skills from many, many different places as well as a very, very uh, robust user community with many moving parts are involved in getting this done. So, we're going to go through from background and conception to potential future enhancements, and then at the end, I'm going to very briefly go through uh, some of the roles that I personally have played, along with a cast of literally thousands, in making this system come together. Automatic dependent surveillance broadcast. So where were we and, and, and why did we come up with this system? Well we had some we had infrastructure in our national airspace system for air traffic control or ATC surveillance of aircraft uh, that really haven't changed fundamentally since the 1950s with the advent of radar. And so ATC uh, performed surveillance using either radar if you're over the oceans, they would use HF data HF voice communications to an operator who would then relay the message from the pilot to the uh, to the air traffic controller and then it would relay back to the pilot somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic. Uh, and because we had such lousy uh, well high latency voice communications when you're over the ocean, you can well imagine that the separation between aircraft, both laterally and in trail, how many minutes in trail, uh, has been pretty big, necessarily, to ensure safety of the traveling public. We started out with primary radars. So primary radar, non-cooperative target, you do, a, you do skin paint and you get a return. The uh, aircraft that is being surveilled doesn't communicate anything may not know it's being surveilled unless it's got countermeasure equipment on it. And uh, they were enhanced but not entirely replaced by secondary surveillance radars where you send a signal to the aircraft, the aircraft has a transponder on it, says, hey, I'm being pinged, I'm going to send some information back to the source. Very interesting uh, are the separation standards that we use for aircraft in on route terminal airspace today are based upon what we can do with, essentially, with secondary surveillance radars. And it led to the Mode Select, Mode S, secondary, sur secondary surveillance radar. Uh, as is typical with aviation systems, it took 15, 20 years to put this stuff in. Uh, I liken the Mode S radar to a Maserati. It's got all sorts of bells and whistles. It can communicate all sorts of data to the, commu to the aircraft and get it back. and Retains all sorts of information about the aircraft with which the radar is interacting. Yeah, right. But when we implemented the MODIS system, 
uh, we didn't change the air traffic control systems, of which there are four in the national airspace system. You might think there's this monolithic air traffic control system. Nope, got four. Four very different ones, four different platforms. We didn't change them. So we got this Maserati communicating using a format that was invented in the 1960s to back to air traffic control. So think of, and I hope I don't offend anybody here, but taking a Maserati out and driving it like it's a Ford Fiesta. Okay? No offense intended to Fiesta owners. Or as they say in Washington, if someone if if, if, if someone was offended, there was no intent, right? Mm -hmm. So okay. So only the controller had the ability to, to have the situational awareness. Well, so we had a confluence of events in the 80s, late 80s and early 90s. The GPS constellation went operational, initial operational capability for aviation in 1993. Uh, we got much more multi-sensor integrative flight management systems on our aircraft. That's a story in and of itself. The flight management community is sort of unlike any other in aviation and unto itself. And if you don't know the secret handshake, uh, you get a polite hello and, and, and not much else. They're sort of doing their thing. We have the Rand C, which has since been decommissioned, and improved inertial reference units. Every generation of inertial technology, we get about an order of magnitude improvement in our 95% drift rate per hour. And so we had just gone through a new generational movement in inertials. And so the MODIS radar system had the data communication capabilities, which were generally unused, people realized that we could do better with regard to surveillance. Now, as with any good idea, there are many, many uh, people who claim parenthood. And that's fine. I don't know what's happening. But we'll go with the flow. Any clue? This is the computer science side of the building. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted. Duly noted. I'll go get uh, 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 a <laughs> Hey, good. Actually, can I suggest a hardware solution? If you are you're using the HDMI, right? Yeah. So the HDMI on this seems to have a disagreement of opinion with some computers, but if you have a VGA adapter, that'll work better. Probably. Okay. So you're trying to shift the blame to hardware. <laughs> okay, folks, so we had, we had four people who could legitimate, four groups and or people who could legitimately claim ownership on the concept. In 1990, Ed Frauden came up with a patent broadcasting position and available communication channel information. He was thinking of remote airspace where the aircraft would transmit not only here's where I am, but also here's the frequencies on which you can contact me. The latter part of that never got used in the ADSB system. So while he did some seminal work, it didn't actually lead, get into the operational implementation. In Sweden, Haken Lanz put together a VHF system with a uh, TDMA with a slot stealing scheme, that's what he called it, that would enable uh, participants uh, in the surveillance system to select the slots on which they would transmit their position. And this, this will be a dynamic slot selection. And this led to VHF Digital Link 4. Now, Professor Steer and I were talking this morning about co-site interference, uh, in, in which he's an acknowledged expert. Uh, this video more for us, we'll see a little, in a little bit, is an example of a system in which millions and millions of dollars were invested, but they never thought enough. It got international standards, but they never thought enough about the platform on which they were putting the system. And they ended up having co-site interference with their VHF voice. And with all the standards and all the work, that system didn't fly, pun intended. <laughs> and then MIT Lincoln came up with uh, the use uh, using uh, a facet of the, of the MODES surveillance system to uh, have an extended square. And it's linked to the legacy MODES system and the collision avoidance system. The, the, in the U.S., we call it TCAS, Traffic Collision Avoidance System, uh, that has been used since the early 90s uh, by air transport aircraft to uh, sense uh, proximate traffic that, that, that's equipped with radar transponders and avoid it. So, MITRE began development of uh, the UAT system, and this was uh, 
in the lower portions of what aviation terms the L band, so that was just below one gigahertz, and we'll talk about this stuff later. But the concept development started, and to frame this thing, the concept development happened in the early 90s. The full operational implementation of this system in the U.S. will occur on January 1st, 2020. Now, so we're talking about roughly 30 years from concept to operational implementation. This is a figure out of the MIT Lincoln patent. And let's see how that works. Yeah. Uh, basically, you would have satellite positioning. You would have what they call an extended square. Just think of it as a message going to a MODES ground station, which relay the information back to air traffic control. And, and so this would be ADSB out, out of the aircraft to the ground. And ADSB out is what's being mandated for operation in many parts of the national airspace by Jan 1, 2020. And then they would also communicate, they would have the capability to pick up these messages themselves and have improved air-to-air -air situational awareness. That's called ADSBN. That's not mandated, but we've got right now about 35,000 aircraft equipped with it, and that number is rising rapidly. So, speaking about general aviation, I noticed that at least one member of this audience uh, has a picture on his uh, Google in an aircraft cockpit. Right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, in fact, two probably. <laughs> so, think of the before being not having this information, and you see an avoid aircraft when you're flying your when you're flying your Piper or your Cessna. You see an avoid them using your Mark One eyeball. That's it. And for those of you who have not been piloting aircraft. Acquiring, visually acquiring aircraft at any distance is not easy. It's, it's not one of those things that, oh yeah, I see him, he's 10 miles off. I mean, it, not happening. It's, it's difficult to do, particularly when you're paying attention in your, in your primary field of view, flying your aircraft. So think of nothing compared to having your own ship signal. Whoops, sorry about that. Having your own ship signal and seeing proximate traffic, what their, what their relative altitude to you is. This is an example of a general aviation ADS-BM display uh, produced and on many aircraft from the Abadine Corporation. So it has been heralded as the largest safety improvement for general aviation in this country in the last 50 years. So we had the concepts, then we had to go through system level design decisions and worldwide standardization. So we commissioned in 1995 uh, an organization called RTCA. It used to be Radio Technical Commission Aeronautics. But it's an aviation standards group to develop system performance standards uh, for this ADS-B system. The, primary, the initial primary thrust was air-to-air. -air. The reason was is that nobody at that time believed that the FAA would modernize its infrastructure to ingest ADSB data, so let's at least get better situational awareness between aircraft. We established it in uh, 1995. It was for airborne equipment, standards for airborne equipment with interfaces to ATC ground systems. Consensus document, hundreds of participants, manufacturers, pilots, operators, general aviation uh, groups, uh, the Federal Aviation Administration, uh, subject matter specialists in radio frequency communications, the list goes on. And we had limited a input from FAA ATC as the group expected we would have. ATC was busy running the airspace, and uh, at, but they're a major stakeholder in the system. So part of the story here is getting everybody aligned on a path, and some, you, you don't want them to come kicking and screaming, but you need to influence over time to get stuff done. And, when you speak with an air traffic controller and you yourself are not an air traffic controller, uh, you start off with a you start off with a bit of a hill to climb because that is a culture unto itself. You need to build acceptance of yourself, and this is one of these interdisciplinary system engineering things. If you're going to put in this kind of system, 
You need to become accepted in that community as if not knowledgeable, like a true air traffic controller would be. At least you understand the problems and you care. And that opens the door to very fruitful discussions. It took three years to develop. And if you want to see hundreds of engineers in a room having a blind man and an elephant discussion, you know, what's the elephant look like? The old blind man and the, ele blind man and the elephant. Uh, we had plenty of those, but we came out with a standard, which a lot of people thought we couldn't do, for system requirements. And here's a figure out of the standard. And it's largely what we're implementing today. You've got the aircraft communicating air to air with ADSB and to an ADSB receiver. They're receiving <coughs> their positions from satellites and perhaps from some other ground based NAV aids. There is a secondary surveillance radar and a primary surveillance radar, like those we've discussed. They don't go away completely. They put the radar inputs in, then we ingest the ADSB inputs in, we, we have a fusion process on the surveillance, and we go to the air traffic service automation system. This is close to what we actually implemented, and this document was written 22 years before our mandate compliance did. So the concept was maturing. So then we had to say, well, how are we going to do this? Let's get into what the mechanisms for communication are. And there were three candidate links. Which link should be used? The legacy MODIS radar community said, we have the answer. Let's use this, you know, let's use this Maserati MODIS radar, not as a Ford Fiesta, but maybe as a Honda Civic. You know, let's take advantage of some of its capabilities, and, and, and that would be a good thing. Uh, this resonated with our air transport class users, the major airlines, because they already had some MODIS equipment on their aircraft and it would uh, lower their costs of retrofit. So it was very popular on a worldwide basis, except we had a technical problem that we had to overcome. The secondary surveillance radar system, the interrogations go up on 1030 megahertz, the responses from the aircraft to the ground come on 1090 megahertz. So we're going to do ADSB extended squitters on 1090 megahertz and radar returns on 1090 megahertz. Oops, 1090 is the response frequency for the TCAS collision avoidance system. We have three major aviation systems, all proposed to be on the same frequency for major volumes of data. Can we make them interoperate? Now, the rules of the road, if you're trying to put a new system in uh, to the National Airspace System, is you don't get other systems to change because you've got this great idea. You have to change to be compatible with the systems that are out there. So the, you know, so the aviation industry's uh, wide Safe Flight 21 Steering Group commissioned a link evaluation team in 1999 to look at three links, the, v, the VHF link I mentioned before, the UAT link that might have come up with in the 900 to, a, to megahertz to a gigahertz area. And once we did that, we came up with some results in the FAA and Eurocontrol, the Aviation Authority, uh, ATC Authority for Europe, said, that's very interesting. Now we have to do our own study. So they did a follow-up study. I mean, you couldn't believe what this Safe Flight 21 steering group did. We're the air navigation service providers. So we're going we're gonna to do our own. And we had a joint TLAP technical link evaluation team. Now, I was co-chair of the Safe Flight 21 steering group and link evaluation team. And I was the facilitator for the FAA Euro Control technical link evaluation team. Now, facilitator is a fancy word when you're in that kind of context for convincing your colleagues that the laws of physics work the same on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. And so here's a modeling diagram out of a 2001 presentation of the TLAT results, the technical link assessment team. We took future traffic scenarios for, uh, for several uh, dense air spaces, core, uh, core Europe uh, and uh, the Los Angeles basin for the you know, future projection of, of, of traffic densities. We did various modeling. We knew, we, we had to know where all the radars were, right? Because we knew that there were going to be radar returns coming and we had to look at the at the co-frequency issues on 1090 megahertz uh, for the extended squitter. 
We had some evaluation criteria that were, was put together by a group of stakeholders. Uh, we had receiver and waveform models, and we validated what our models were showing. We had modeling done by the MITRE Corporation, by MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and John Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. And a little later in the game, not now, but we got the, uh, the Joint Spectrum Center of the Department of Defense involved as well in the system. So I talked about the traffic scenarios. We had message success rates, or MSRs. We charted them by link, uh, by scenario. And we had a variety of applications of ADSB. Uh, a number of these were air to air. One on the next chart would be uh, enhanced uh, surveillance, uh, air to ground. And we rated each of the three links. And uh, Professor Steer and I were talking about techno-political discussions. And uh, a number of these discussions were what I would call techno-political, careful nuancing of technical facts, etc. But we worked through and got consensus uh, of the parties. And the clear winner was the UAT. Think about it, it was a clean sheet design. We were going to put it on an open frequency. We actually could find one in that part of the L-band. We'll talk about that in a minute. But, uh, and it didn't meet absolutely all the requests, but it was a clean sheet design oriented toward ADSB. Now, do you think that because it was the best technical solution, it was widely heralded and adopted? That would be wrong. The worldwide solution that we've ended up using is the one that fit with the legacy equipment on the air transport class aircraft uh, and was good enough. So the extended squitter uh, is, the, is the worldwide solution for ADSB on 1090 megahertz. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Here, hey, I'm... questions, yes. Yeah, I, was getting, I was trying to make a note and I couldn't open it up because you looked at it. <laughs> <laughs> but I see here you talked about the FAA yep. and Euro control. Yep. And I think Boeing and Airbus, and I don't see... Boeing and Airbus weren't on that team. So what about Asia? There's no, did you have people from Asia involved in this? or was it in Not Asia? in 2001. Not in 2001. We're going to get to a chart, two or three now, where we talk about the international involvement. But I will tell you that the Australians were the first in the world to mandate automatic dependent surveillance broadcast in their on route airspace. And why not? Think about the ge geography of the country. All of a sudden, they could go from procedural voice separations, which was what they had over with, with large separation standards, which is what they had over most of their airspace, apart from their major terminal areas. They could go to five nautical mile separations countrywide in their upper airspace. Australia was the first to actually mandate and implement the system. Hey, George, can we back up one slide, too? Sure, Kyle. The very last line, really interesting. OK, back one. Let's see this way. Yes, sir. Autonomous air-to-air -air operations are not supported. Right. Autonomous air-to-air -air operations, this had to do with TCPs or trajectory change points, put a lot more data on the link. And because of the increased data and the fact with UAT, we were trying to make it low power. With 1090 megahertz extended squitter, we had the other systems that you, you lump all the transmissions together, you wouldn't get a high enough message success rate at long distance, at uh, you know, to 150 nautical miles. So, so we just ran into a stumbling block. The VHF solution wouldn't do it either. It was additional data and very long range. Uh, and it ran contrary to some of the design parameters and, and system parameters of the proposed solutions. And looking at, look at that in 2001 is kind of interesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the U.S. ADSB link decision was made in 2002. Those of the international folks went with extended square. Well, 1090 is required. The link decision was that it would be required above 18,000 feet. And below 18,000 feet, you could use UAT if you wanted to. We have many UAT-equipped aircraft. It's being used by general aviation for a variety of reasons. But that was the U.S. ADSB link decision. Pretty much everyone else has gone with 1090 ES. 
And so here's the FAA implementation architecture from 2003. And you know, it ended up being pretty close to this. You have these two links. You'd have some aircraft without ADSB. They would be surveilled using uh, legacy radar type systems. You would have a multi-link gateway. Since we had two links, we would broadcast information down, you know, ADSB information from people on this link through the gateway and broadcast it back up for ADSB in equipped aircraft on the other link. Uh, we would put flight information service broadcast on the UAT link. Very interesting design. We could so we could talk an hour or two uh, very productively just about how we put the UAT system in the airspace and, and what it is. Do a surveillance tracker to ATC. So, from 1998 to 2010, we had a bunch of standards work to support the link decision. And uh, we had to develop standards for the equipment to go on the aircraft. We had to establish standards, safety and performance requirements for ADSB applications. We coordinated with Eurocade, Eurocontrol, and the International Civil Aviation Organization in Montreal, like CAO, and uh, had to do all that good stuff, and we had to put a ground station tech specification together, and you know, in Washington they like to think in billions, right? So it was a $1.8 billion award to ITT to put the ground infrastructure in for the country for ADSB. But that doesn't even begin to touch the costs of changing the automation systems, of which there are four, to be able to ingest the information and put it on the controller screen. This is just for the radio stations, the nationwide network of receivers that would provide ADSB information to service delivery points. Busy chart, not going to go through it, but this is what RTCA and URK ADSB documentation did. Each one of those lines is a standard, a consensus standard developed by hundreds of people. And then at ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. We had to put together standards and recommended practices and documentation. I had the uh, actually just wonderful experience of leading one of the subgroups up at ICAO uh, on the worldwide standardization of uh, one of the links. And uh, very, very interesting, that culture. We can talk about that at length, but we got it done. And again, we got it done in a time frame that many people up at ICAO uh, didn't think we could do. Uh, ICAO is called with affection the snail in the aviation uh, industry. Nothing happens very rapidly there, uh, except the commissariat where you get the super free, duty free booze is always there on time, always open, and the coffee breaks can be counted on, and, there, and the two and a half hour lunches are nice too. So, We've got the standards, we've got the concept. Well, we need rulemaking in order to make the system work. You don't want a lot of mixed mode stuff. You don't want people up in on route airspace, some equipped and some not equipped. If the system's going to work, everybody needs to be equipped. So we have rulemaking. And we had a, we had a rulemaking uh, committee. Uh, they asked me to be on that as well. We made recommendations to the FAA for a rule for ATC service. Surveillance, ADSB out. 1,400 comments, all very pub, you know, public input, 36 summary recommendations since September 2008. And I'd like to go through a few of these because when we, whoops, when we get to operational implementation, this kind of stuff, and each one of these was worked out across the user domains, both within the government and within, within the private sector. Uh, you get to know the people in flying engineering, technical, the technical pilots at all the major airlines. You go into most of their operation centers. You work with the FAA or traffic controllers. You really, if it's going to work, you need to make sure you're realistic. It takes a 10-year period for fleet equipage after the publication of the rule. The two drivers on 10 years of the Department of Defense with all their platforms, if you think about it, and the air transport industry uh, can do it in seven. General aviation takes about 10. Fleet-wide. It was a condition, basically, of 
that was doing this role in the user community's view, in the community's, aviation community's view, was conditional upon the FAA putting the darn infrastructure in before the rule went into place. There was a lack of credibility that the FAA would actually do that. Uh, there have been several examples in the recent past where the FAA had said, yeah, we're going to do this, yeah, we're going to do this, equip your aircraft. The Department of Defense spent $1 billion putting systems into the microwave landing system. And then in 1995, the FAA uh, asked me to facilitate a meeting where we said, just boom, not going to do it, made a decision not to put MLS in, and uh, our friends in the DOD were left holding a $1 billion bag. Uh, there were a number of other examples of that. Okay, so uh, clarifications of you know where is this rule going to be applicable? It's not going to. It's not applicable everywhere. It's applicable in certain portions of our national airspace system. And we uh, also suggested that we define a strategy for ADSB in that's air to air stuff by 2012. The rule went in ten years before the compliance date. The rule was published in the Federal Register CFR. Uh, May 2010, and one thing, to get the system in in only 30 years from the concept, we had to do a comparative analysis based, you know, to radar. We compared it with an existing system that was adjudged to be safe, as opposed to doing a bottom-up target level of safety analysis. A quick question. Yeah. So in, in these discussions, um, what groups represent sort of the, the civil aviation folks? I mean, I can see there's the you know, the, the commercial folks and the transport folks. Yeah, well, we, we love all these folks. Uh, we tend to call them the alphabet soup groups. So you've got, you've got uh, Alpha representing the pilots, Airline Pilots Association. You've got the Airline Owner and Pilots Association representing general aviation. You've got uh, Airlines for America representing the air transport uh, air transport class group. You've got the Cargo Airline Association representing FedEx and, and UPS. And in fact, Cargo Airline Association was a was a real leader in putting ADS BN. How many of you heard of the Collier Prize? A few of you, right? ADSB won the Collier Prize. Won the Collier Prize in uh, oh, I forget the year, 2007, 2008. It's a big deal, folks. It's a, one of the major awards uh, in aviation or the out-of-the-box thinking about a major new system. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, air, what's an airspace rule? <coughs> okay, if you're above uh, 18,000 feet, uh, you're in Class A airspace, that is onward airspace, that's where, you're, that's where you and I fly uh, as the traveling public once we get out of terminal areas. If you are in Class B or Class C airspace, that is the terminal airspace of major and mid-sized Airports, all tower in this country. You, you're going to have to have ADSB equipage for A, B, C, and major portions of Class E airspace. There are portions of the airspace. I mean, if you want to fly at 500 feet over uh, cornfields in uh, the Midwest, you can do it. You don't need this system. But if you're in controlled airspace, uh, you need it if you're under positive air traffic control. So, operational implementation. The industry was on this thing. The rule came out in 2010. We had a joint industry ADSB implementation working group sponsored by the industry that invited the FAA to come in and say, how are you doing on getting that infrastructure in? What issues do we have with operational implementation? This went on for four, uh, for, uh, four years. And, uh, Regular updates by the FAA, discussions of issues, and we had plenty of operational implementation issues. Don't try to read it. The, but it's an example agenda, and it shows the organizations on the left, some of the ones we were just talking about, Greg. Uh, we also had NACA in there, the, the National Air Traffic Controllers Association, uh, the Helicopter Association International. GAM is the General Aviation Manufacturers Association. Uh, association of manufacturers that make uh, gear for our 200,000 general aviation aircraft. And we would, you know, look at the issues. Now, I told you that we had a recommendation to look at ADSB in policy, air to air stuff, and the FAA spurred by Congress, and you know the way that happens, right? 
special interest group number 43 sends their lobbyist up on the hill. And they talk to Congressman number XYZ and say, Congress or the staff generally, you don't talk to members. And you know, we really need to get the FAA, we need to push those guys to get a rulemaking effort underway for have, you know, mandating ADSBN air to air ability to the ADSB is the ability of the aircraft to ingest ADSB information from other aircraft and present it to the pilot. And Congressman says, yeah, they throw it in on page 406 of the reauthorization bill, and all of a sudden the FAA administrator has a requirement to report to Congress within 90 days what he's doing about this. And so they put a rulemaking committee together as a result of this congressional mandate. And we looked at it very carefully within this committee and said, look, there's no business case per yet. The business case doesn't sell for air transport class aircraft. It just doesn't. So why are we going to mandate this thing, really? Remember, the air transport class aircraft already have a collision avoidance system on board. They get less benefit. The, G the GA guys don't want a mandate. They, most of them have ADSBN and are using it, but they don't want it to be because they're required to do so. So we prioritized ADSB and applications that said no rule. And uh, I'd like to give you an example of wonderful engineering that goes nowhere in the midst of talking <coughs> with you about great engineering that goes somewhere. The number 10 application here, airport, I'll read it, airport traffic situation awareness with indications and alerts at airports. It was wonderful engineering. You know. I, I, uh, uh, I've been on the technical governing body of RTCA for 18 years, and uh, we interacted with the folks doing the work. It was great, just great work, except for one thing. In order to implement the application as they were specifying it, we require a fleet-wide retrofit of our GPS position sources. How do you spell dead on arrival? I think the acronym is DOA. And yet, our engineers kept, kept going with it. They published it. It got deprioritized by the FAA because, you know, it, it's, it's excellent analysis of what you could do if you had upgraded position sources. But the likelihood of it operating as specified in the next 30 years in the national airspace is about zero. But we need good ideas, right? So. FAA thought that maybe implementation of ADSB and aircraft was going too slow, so they had a call to action meeting in October of 2014. FAA Deputy Administrator called it. I facilitated it. It was with the industry. We had in, we had industry association vice presidents right and left, various operators, etc. The community. We reviewed progress on ADSB equipage. Uh, there were some obstacles that had gotten us stuck. Uh, some hard-headedness within certain aspects of the community, FAA sometimes, sometimes operators, and it was amazing how we were able to work through those through. We worked through several of those. If we got in a room and said, you know, do we all accept this isn't going to happen? Yeah. All right. So what are we going to do about it? As opposed to complaining at each other about it's not going to happen. Well, it should. It's not going to happen. Well, it should. Well, get the folks in the room, work it out, and we did. We uh, identified actions for subsequent resolution by an industry FAA equipped 2020 initiative, which is still ongoing, and I have the privilege of being one of the three plenary leads of it. This is from our last session in uh, December, and again, we have representation of a lot of people in the industry. Uh, we have things like heat maps, showing what percentage of the operations being flown in the national airspace system today are being flown by aircraft with equipped with rule compliant ADSB. This chart is a very interesting chart. It's a busy chart, but I'm going to focus on one thing. There are, or two numbers, sorry. We have 40,000 aircraft equipped. We keep a running count. We have 40,000 aircraft equipped in this country now with ADSB out, rule compliant. Of those, seven eighths of them are equipped with ADSB in. So those pilots will be able to 
get operational situational awareness, much like the air traffic controllers have, of proximate traffic. We have, this is a uh, chart that is presented by the FAA Surveillance and Broadcast Systems Program Office every quarter. What that doesn't say, that's only that's less than 25% of the fleet, though. Yeah, but it doesn't all need to be equipped. It doesn't all need to be equipped. Yeah, and so the big, one of the big questions is, I mean, as Kyle has, has accurately mentioned, we have about 200,000 registered general aviation aircraft in this country. Okay? And a lot of them aren't going to get equipped because a lot of them do not fly in that rural airspace. A lot more are going to get equipped, and one of the things we've looked at is the equipage timeline. Who are the service providers who can equip your aircraft? How long do you have to wait? What's the queue? Length of the queue to get in if you want to get equipped. And trading those things off have been one of the major points of discussion. Another one has been ADSB position sources. We're going to go with multi-constellation dual frequency receivers for GPS. Yeah, when? Well, we think they'll be in large quantity certified installable sometime around 2024 to 2026. How does that fit with all this? If I'm an air transport class guy, do I upgrade my position source now to meet the rule and then have, and then upgrade it again in 2026? That's a non-starter with the people who run the airlines, okay? So how do we work that out too? And potential future enhancements? Well, as I, as I indicated, we got ADSB in the airspace using comparability to radar. So we're using radar separation standards with a system that can do a lot better. Sounding like a Maserati being used like a Ford Fiesta? Yeah, this, is a, this, is a, this story can repeat itself in aviation because we have, we have convinced ourselves in our safety culture that, uh, that we have to have seven nines reliability of this and nine nines uh, of, uh, you know, uh, probably, you know, one minus nine nines probability of certain other things happening. And we made it so hard for new systems to enter the airspace that about the only way we can get a major system in, if we want to do it in only 30 years from concept to full operational implementation, that we do it comparing its performance to a system which we think is safe. Now, you ask yourself, inquiring mind might say, well, wait a minute, we got a lot of systems out there in the airspace. Did all of them pass this level of safety scrutiny? Answer would be no. In 2005, the FAA realized that the safety scrutiny it was putting new systems under would not be met by the majority of the systems that it was using and had been using for several decades to operate the airspace. They were all grandfathered in as safe enough. So new system entrant, you know, I mean, you know, pay no attention to that dust under the rug, right? So, yeah, we can get better separations inherently in this system. It's going to take target level of safety analyses, very stringent safety analyses to do so, but it will happen. Uh, over the ocean, we've got Arion using Iridium satellites to listen to aircraft ADSB transmissions over the ocean, relay them to the ground. We believe that we can have the entrail and lateral separations. That puts four, you know, that gives us four times the, uh, that's a 4x advantage in terms of uh, using space-based ADSB. And ADSB in, the, in applications. Uh, flight deck based interval management, I got a picture here, whoops, yeah, okay. I've shown you the early pattern, I showed you the, the, the picture of ADSB operation from the MASPs uh, in 1998, showed you another picture about FAA implementation in 2003. We're actually getting here, this is basically the way the system's working. The aircraft get their positions. The ground stations broadcast weather to general aviation over the UAT link on 978 megahertz. We could talk a day about getting the UAT system approved internationally to operate in 978 megahertz. That was a, that's quite a story in and of itself. But we did get it in the airspace. 
uh, aircraft broadcast their position and other data to aircraft and ground stations. And we have all four of our automation systems ingesting this data, fusing it with radar data where we've got radar data, and presenting it to the controllers on their screens. Now, if you look at this chart uh, and compare the before, this is without flight deck based interval management and ADSBN application, to after, this is in a dense terminal area, high, high traffic terminal area. The idea is, is that you use ADSBN for this second aircraft to maintain a distance specified by the controller from the aircraft in front. Because this aircraft in the back has the ADSB information from the aircraft in the front, it can maintain its, it can maintain the controller specified difference. New concept in aviation in terms of separation. And we'll be doing this. Uh, we'll be doing this in some of our densest terminal areas, even with air transport class aircraft. Certain por certain portions of the air transport class fleet will equip with ADSB in about 10 years. Okay, so roles of a interdisciplinary computer system engineer. Yeah, I'm dating myself, but I was the founding secretary of 186 in 1995. Help with standards. We talked about the link evaluation team being facilitator of the technical link assessment team. Rapporteur, that's ICAO for leader or the person who reports. And you know, it's international, so it's going to be French. No offense. If offense was taken by any French, native French people, none was intended. And a uh, member of a backup study, what are we going to do if the GPS constellation renders ADSB uh, inoperable for a period of time, operationally significant period of time? Uh, we're an ADSB subgroup with the industry, member of a couple of rulemaking committees, the joint work group. Uh, the deputy administrator asked me to uh, facilitate the call to action call to action meeting in 2014. Plenary co-lead. The drift is, and this is a chart I used with some aspiring young scientists and engineers in Kathmandu uh, in six, 2016, and I thought it would be appropriate, sort of the going off the stage. Can they pay me for doing this, right? Well, let's think about this. The systems have saved lives, and they're of high impact. Air transportation systems safer and more efficient, affecting the traveling public. And you're part of this with, with many, many, many other people. Working with colleagues all over the world in many disciplines, you never stop learning. If you're a lifelong learner, you want to be an interdisciplinary com computer system engineer. There are many other things you can be and be a lifelong learner. But, you know, think of that fire hose coming down. You work with subject matter experts, right? And they have forgotten more about their specialty than you will ever know. But they teach you. When you establish the rapport and the leadership and the credibility, they teach you. You never stop learning. And you have a world, we have a worldwide shortage of people who can do this kind of stuff. You know, you have to be comfortable dealing with the pilots, and the bean counters who effectively run the airlines in many ways, the senior vice presidents of flight operations, the senior people, and the working troops within the, within the FAA, by way of example in this system, engineers at major manufacturers, Airbus, Boeing, Airframers, Embraer, uh, Bombardier. Uh, we have a worldwide shortage of people who can do this, who tie it all together. And in our engineering programs, this is something we really, in my view, should be focusing on. And some universities do it very well, and others not so well. Having fun while learning, working with great people, and seeing your colleagues work have an impact is hard to beat. Now, a number of you are in that position. You know what I'm talking about. When you see something you've worked on, save lives. Improve the posture of the United States in theater uh, of, our, of our forces. When you see this actually happening, that is as good as it gets in terms of engineering where we get stuff done. 
So thank you for your attention. It's been a real pleasure coming here, and any and all questions are welcome. Thanks. Questions? Yes, sir? Okay, I'll do it. Um, so, um, excellent talk. Thanks very much. So, uh, I understand your thing about the five nines and seven nines. I completely get it. Uh, uh, but I was wondering if there's a human element in there that's uh, kind of in the loop, if that's the concern. As in, uh, this, this is something in, I think, uh, I, I know nothing of this, but in ground vehicles automation, I think this is being more and more looked at is if people get used to certain things, certain information being available, then they get dependent on it, and when it's not. So let's say some aircrafts have ADS-B in and others don't. Right. Okay, you brought up several very interesting points. Uh, one of my quibbles with the way that probabilistic risk analysis is applied uh, by the FAA, by my friends in the FAA, I mean, I know these people, they're good people, is that they tend, when it comes to the avionics and what's on the aircraft, to get out their five, five nines, their seven nines, their nine nines, and then as they come up the fault tree, they realize they have no prayer of meeting the target level of safety. And so they put up what I call the infamous fudge factor in. So you say, well, what's the probability of the pilot, given this information, missing the alert? And that number. And that number is at two significant digits. What we do with the aircraft and the avionics is at five, seven, and nine significant digits. It's been likened to me uh, of measuring with a micrometer so that you can subsequently cut something with an ax. Uh, with regard to human interactions, yes, quite apart from my, my view of fudge factors, there are some very serious factors that are put in. We, we run extensive uh, human-in-the-loop simulations, both from the pilot and from the air traffic controller, uh, perspective before we put the system, as part of putting the system in. And we run Hiddle's uh, human in the loop simulations uh, for all of our ADSBN applications. Does that fully answer your question? I'm not sure it does. Uh, mostly, I think. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Just a clarification. So the class E airspace, uh, where, so some class E goes down to the surface. So where does the I notice the rule says certain class E airspaces. Yeah, cut it's class E above a certain altitude. I could look in the, I mean, Paul, do you know? I, I think it's related to class C's. Yeah. Class C's around class C's. Yeah. One of the guys uh, with the, in the cockpit, where do you fly? RV8. Yeah. Okay, since you pointed me out, let me ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, um, uh, why require uh, the high precision ADSB. It adds that is cost. a great question, and you know there's a lot of dust under that rug as well. So what we did when we looked at the comparability to radar for en route, and you don't need high precision ADSB for to match five nautical mile separations in en route airspace. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, you need a integrity category that is several levels below that in the rule. The rule is a seven. The, what you need for under is five, and your accuracy, it, uh, your 95% accuracy need not be as good as all. Well. If you get into the terminal airspace, we had a raging debate. The Europeans said we don't need that stringent and integrity number, the one that's in the rule, for terminal operations. It was really on the cusp, because radar is a system where your accuracy and integrity get better the closer you are. It's an angular system. So when you're approaching that runway threshold, radar is pretty darn accurate. If you're 15, 20 miles out, not so accurate as a move away. So there is the big debate about whether we needed a NIC at this level, a navigation integrity category reported by an uh, air aircraft using ADS-B, or this next more stringent level, which is the one you're talking about, I'm sure. Okay. And the Europeans said we can go with a we can go with this, and the U.S. said there is a portion for full equivalency. You've got to have full equivalency all the way down to that runway threat, all the way down to when you fall out of radar coverage as you're on approach, which you know depending upon 
what approach you're flying 400, 600 feet, I guess, above <laughs> touchdown. And, and so there, there was this little space right at where air, radar is most accurate where you just went over the line by just a little bit to that navigation integrity category. And so that was the one selected. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turns out that the United States is going to use ADSB in ways that most other countries are not in terms of uh, parallel runway operations on the surface. And, and for those operations, there is worldwide agreement that you need the level of stringency of the position integrity indicator that is in the rule. Kyle. So, 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 so given that, right, and, and that level of performance and accuracy, how much of a risk is it that ADSB does not have encryption? As we look at today's data world. It's intended not to have encryption. You know, that's one of the that's one of the interesting things about it. It is intended to be a broadcast system where you openly tell people where you are. And the concern about people listening in and things of this nature, you know, it reminds me of, uh, it, you know, it, 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 it reminds me of a discussion that two British statisticians were having in a, uh, I love the Brits, educated at Oxford, etc. but two British statisticians, they're a breed apart, believe me, uh, were having, uh, and it, it was a vigorous debate about which was safer. And they finally concluded that a probability of 10 to the minus 45th of a, of a negative event was much safer than 10 to the minus 41st. All of these are totally out of the design of the air, uh, of design parameters of the airspace, but people have those discussions. Then there was the guy who was talking about the microwave landing system compared to GPS landing systems. And the problem was you could spoof GPS landing systems. And at that time, the IRA was still quite active. And this was another one of my British colleagues. And he, he said, oh, no, a terrorist could spend two, the IRA could spend $2,000, and they could totally take down your GPS approaches around Heathrow Airport. True. So somebody thought to ask the right question, because this guy was an advocate of the microwave landing system. Well, couldn't you do the same thing with MLS? Oh, no, that's completely different. It would cost $3,000 to take down all of the approaches with the microwave landing system. So, it, so it, do we need to have encryption on these links? Some people need privacy. That's been one of the uh, major discussion points we've had in the Equip 2020 group uh, with the industry. And we are going to establish a privacy office. A lot of our major business aircraft, for example, you know, Amazon CEO does not want his competition to know that his aircraft is flying from point A to point B when he's doing an acquisition. And so we're going to have a mechanism for that whereby the FAA will know that that's Amazon's aircraft. But people are listening into the ADSB broadcast one. Yes, sir. Just to follow up on that, if the question is not privacy or confidentiality, but rather spoofing. I mean, can you make the system and broadcast messages that make it look like you're somewhere else where you're actually not? Can you do it? Yes. Well, can you do it in the aircraft? No. Well, no, no is too strong a word. Lots of things are possible. <laughs> Highly unlikely that it would be done within the aircraft. No, it's even worse. Can I impersonate you? Yes. Yes, and then that, that's the problem. So okay, can I appear to be you in a different uh, different location, which then potentially the TCAS can kick in and, and uh, divert, divert to avoid the non-existent. I'm glad you mentioned TCAS because there are multiple <coughs> mechanisms of surveillance on the aircraft, and you'd have to scoop all of them. And that was another point that I was going to make. What makes anybody think that we can't spoof a mode S radar? We can. What makes anybody think that we can't get information from a MODIS radar that tells us that the Amazon guy is going from point A to point B? We can. It's just a little more difficult. The ability to do these things has been out there with our existing surveillance systems for the last 20 years. People tend to forget that. And, we, and yet, we haven't had a major incident with this type of spoofing of our secondary surveillance radar system. Now, 
Today, in most of our airspace, we will still be covered, all of our on-route airspace and, and, and all of our high-density terminal airspace, we're keeping radars. And we're keeping primary radars at the borders for obvious reasons. You know, I mean, some people just don't want you to know they're up there, so you better have a primary radar to, uh, to uh, take care of non-cooperative targets at the border. So it's a good issue. That is, we're going to have further discussions on it. There is no question about it in terms of safety procedures. But I'm pretty unconcerned about air traffic control being forward. And if you look at the, because they've got the multiple sources to ingest and compare in the fusion tracker, and if the ADSB return is way off of where the radar says you are, uh, the alarm bells go up, and ADSB is probably going to get thrown out. So I'm not so worried about air traffic control where there is radar coverage. We have a built-in defensive mechanism. Uh, with regard to TCAS, it's getting its returns from the transponder, from the TCAS transponder on 1090, as it has since 1991. Why and uh, 93, I think the TCAS mandate was in the United States for aircraft with over 19 passengers, was it, Kyle? I think. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, why haven't we been spoofing TCAS for the past, you know, however many years? Almost, almost 30 years. I'm not trying to minimize it. It is something we need to look at and keep looking at. But, uh, I think we've got the safeguards in the system uh, to uh, mitigate uh, most of the potential risks. Great. Well, I, I think that brings us to the end of our time. Let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.